Welcome back to another episode of The Pipeline. This is a very special episode with several in-house guests from Monad Labs. Prior to Monad, Keone and James worked together at Jump Trading and Jump Crypto. Now, Keone is the CEO and James is the CTO at Monad Labs. It is no longer a secret that the parallel EVM is becoming a major narrative across crypto and many teams are claiming to now be working on their own iterations. But amidst the marketing hype on Twitter, there is a lack of reliable information about the impact of parallel EVM and the other essential optimizations to see true performance gains. I'm lucky enough to have both Gigabrains here with me today to unpack the truth for you and shed more light on Monad's premier product, Welcome Keone and James and Kevin as well. Thanks for joining. Awesome. Thanks for having us, Andy. Excited to be here. Yeah, so I think a great place to start is with the parallel EVM, of course. And most people don't know that Monad pushed the first parallel EVM algo over one and a half years ago. What does this mean and how does it stack up to current parallel EVM implementations across the crypto industry? I want to talk first about Monad's optimistic parallel execution algorithm. First of all, I want to clarify that in Monad, transactions are linearly ordered within the block. And the goal is to get to the end state after executing each of those transactions as if they'd just been run one after the other. but hopefully do something more strategic that allows us to complete that work in a shorter period of time. That algorithm, optimistic parallel execution, is actually a pretty simple one. And pretty much here's how it works. A bunch of transactions are run in parallel, generating a bunch of pending results. Each pending result has a record of the inputs and outputs for that transaction. And then we take all these pending results and we commit them in the original order of the transactions. And as we're doing that, if ever we run into a pending result where one of the inputs has since been invalidated, then we just go reschedule that work and wait to commit anything else until um, that transaction has been re-executed. So that's pretty much the algorithm. It's very simple, very intuitive, has some fancy names like optimistic concurrency control, but it's really a simple algorithm. And I guess one thing to highlight there is that Oftentimes, the, all the, although there is re-execution, whenever there's a conflict, that re-execution is usually pretty cheap because um, the inputs that were needed to that transaction are almost always in cache. So it's just a simple cache lookup. That's pretty much the optimistic parallel execution algorithm. We implemented this almost a year and a half ago. And unfortunately, for the you know all the folks that are really excited about parallel execution now. Unfortunately, we found that there actually was not very much of an improvement relative to just executing those transactions serially. And when you look at the reason why that is, um, the answer is, is pretty obvious and also pretty intuitive, which is that the actual bottleneck is state access. So each of those transactions, they have dependencies on accounts, on slots within those accounts. That state is... Um, stored on an SSD in Ethereum. And the cost of like going and reading that SSD uh, is actually quite significant in the grand scheme of things. And the databases that Ethereum and other blockchains that are EVM compatible use to store that state do not support parallel access. So when many virtual machines are running in parallel and going and making reads to the database, they all still bottleneck and it, it effectively is kind of like a single file execution. So we found this over a year and a half ago and we were kind of faced with this problem of how to actually make parallel execution actually have an impact on the performance, which is how we started to go down the route of um, some of the other optimizations that we did. So parallel execution itself or the parallel EVM is a relatively simple algorithm. So if we look at how this stacks up, quote unquote, against other parallel implementations, your take is that it's really about the other optimizations that you're making at the same time, namely at the state database level. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Awesome. 
And I, I'm curious, where did that initial inspiration to build Monad come from? Can you walk us through that story and what you learned along the way after implementing that first parallel EVM? Sure thing. Um, James and I met in 2014. We were working together on a high frequency trading team at Jump Trading. And the job there is basically just to build from scratch a full trading system. We're taking in a bunch of packets from exchanges, making really fast trading decisions, and then sending orders back out to the exchange. Um, it's a very competitive space because if a packet comes in from an exchange and you and your competitor both are reacting at the same time, whoever is able to decide faster and send the order to the exchange actually you know, wins the opportunity to either take liquidity um, for an aggressive order or to get into the queue, into the queue for a passive order. Um, super latency competitive, and that ultimately inspired many iterations of improving the system and shaving off latency and building a really performance system. So we started doing this in 2014, been working together for a long time. And then fast forward to 2021, uh, James and I, along with the, the rest of our team, joined the crypto team at Jump and immediately started working on DeFi projects, supporting different projects. And James in particular was working on Pith. I'll let him talk a little bit about that if he wants to, but basically working on Solana DeFi in particular for about six months where we just realized that there was a huge need for more performant blockchain in general, and in particular, a huge need for more performant EVM uh, because the existing EVM implementations were very uh, inefficient, had not been optimized at the level that we had been optimizing these trading systems from before, and also that our background was like kind of perfect for tackling this problem. We knew it would take a long time. There's a lot of optimizations to do, We're building systems from the ground up to be very performant. But yeah, the initial inspiration was sort of a combination of doing a related job of building a really performant system from the ground up for a different task. And then also, you know, just interacting with both Solana and Ethereum and seeing kind of like the, the difference in performance. Even Solana has a lot of optimizations that can be made. Um, and it's pretty exciting seeing some of those happen as time goes on. But definitely like in the EVM space, there are a ton of optimizations. and. That's really been the the inspiration for Monad initially. Yeah, it seems like uh, definitely over the last month specifically, but probably over the last three months building up, there's been just a ton of talk around parallel EVM. Like it seemed to have captured the attention of a lot of crypto. Um, and I think that people are equating it to just parallel execution, um, which we just talked about, right? Doesn't get a lot of performance gains on its own. It's kind of more like, you know, to draw an analogy, it's like the attractive uh, body of a Lamborghini, um, where it's not really the engine, right? It looks really good up front, but if you just put a Lamborghini body on top of a Toyota Curl engine, you're going to get about the same performance as the Curl itself. Um, and one thing uh, I know, James and Kuni, you guys have talked a lot about on Twitter, is the custom database that kind of allows parallel execution to actually see performance gains. Um James is kind of like the the genius architect behind the Monad database. Um, would love to just hear like a, a high level overview on why Monad database is kind of different from other databases. Why it's important to not just use a standard like uh, PebbleDB or RocksDB uh, implementation when when trying to build a performant EVM. Like, what's the role of the the custom state database here? Yeah, the, so just to step back for a second, the the most expensive parts in in the blockchain are um, your cryptography functions, your um, elliptical curve cryptography, your hashing functions, um, your state access, um, e even the most complex business logic in most smart contracts is actually um, pretty pretty cheap compared to to execute compared to you know the programs that you might find like on your desktop or on your phone so um, there's just not a lot of computation currently in modern blockchain so paralyzing computation by itself doesn't really gain that much um, some clients already have parallel uh, center recovery which is one of the most expensive parts of um, 
transaction execution. Um, so you know, there's not much, not much to gain really there either. Um, you know, you can throw multiple cores. It's kind of a trivially a parallel um, parallel problem. Um, so you know, when we started like profiling the code, we started seeing okay, where is the time actually spent? Um, you will see that the database, like a, just a single read from an SSD, has latency of um, you know maybe like. 80 microseconds to, you know, 100 microseconds or more, uh, depending on what model you have, obviously, what generation, all that sort of, there's all, some, all sorts of parameters there, but it's it's still like orders of magnitude longer than it takes to execute like a simple smart contract. So you'll have multiple reads, you'll have, you know, you might have, you're gonna obviously going to read the sender's account because you need to know their balance, you're going to read the destination account. Um, if there's a proxy account, you got to read that. So you're going to jump a couple accounts. You're going to read slots. Um, if it's ERC20, the data is actually stored in storage slots. You know, your balance is stored in storage slots. If it's Uniswap, there's other sorts of storage there. So if you just kind of like do all this read sequentially, you know, and it's 80 to 100 microseconds, we're assuming here it's not cached, right? Um, in in main memory, so you you kind of sum these all up. It's just like a linear chain of of summation of long times, and it ends up being a long time um, to execute just that single transaction. So um, obviously, you know, you could just throw RAM at it, and you could say, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna require that everyone has a very large, expensive box that sits in a data center somewhere, and and will never actually read from disk. <laughs> so there'll be no latency, and everything will just go very fast you know that's one option um but i think you know you can kind of you can still achieve good performance if you if the code is right and you can extract um performance out of the ssd and um modern ssds a 200 ssd is is an amazing thing these days like everybody should be super impressed with whoever is designing and building this hardware because it's, it's super <laughs> good hardware um you know, I'd like to like meet some of these people someday, Samsung or wherever that they're building this stuff. But um, yeah, it's just like super impressive. And and then you take like that raw performance, and you see what like some of these other databases are doing that um, people are using for blockchain clients, and the t performance is terrible. So like, what what went wrong from starting with like something that's very high performant and ending up with like this terrible sort of performance and um. Obviously, one of the first issues that um, the Geth has is like they're you're embedding one data structure inside of another one that's on disk. So you kind of have this like to every every request is traversing basically sort of two data structures, and it's it's just a very expensive um, operation. There were some other innovations around this. People tried different databases. Um, you have B plus uh, tree databases like LMDB and and MDBX, which is LMDB derivative. You have LSM trees like RocksDB, um, LevelDB. I think was the first one actually. RocksDB was a derivative, um, and some others like that. Um, they each sort of these are just general. The problem with these is they're general databases, so you know they're just meant for somebody to download. You want to like store some data, re request, do some searches, this sort of thing. Um, general data structures, just general application code just is not performant. It's just meant to be performant on average. Um, so if you ever work in like HFT, this is something you'll quickly discover is like, you know, nobody in nobody in HFT uses standard libraries, standard C++ libraries or standard libraries, because these, these are general sort of data structures. If you customize the data structure to the to the trading model, you can extract, you know, way better performance from the hardware. So we're just kind of applying that technique here where we know exactly how we want to use um, the data. We know exactly how we want to store the data. So let's just do it the way it should be done. And, and that's why we started implementing our own database. Got you. Yeah, it sounds like, um, that's like from your, I've never heard someone describe um ssds in such a attractive way that makes me now in awe uh, well i grew up with like spinning disks so you know the old hard drives <laughs> were like <laughs> and your computer were very slow and you had to you know the the 
the technique back then was like you had to read stuff sequentially um, because the disc is basically spinning and you want to like grab it and just read like what's on the disc, you know, sequentially. And um, so maybe it's just because I'm older, but SSDs are pretty amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it sounds like there is just a ton of juice packed into SSDs that if you customize them to be efficient, you can get massive performance gains over just using the standard model um, and standard kind of structures that uh, seem to be kind of, you know, across the industry, the, the way that people are typically using these SSDs. Um, so yeah, that... A, a modern SSD, um, like the ones we just got for some of our hosts, are like they're 500,000 IO operations per second. So it's pretty amazing, but you, you know, you got to leverage that. Um, you can't just like, you can't throw, um, you know, one thing you study in computer science is like complexity, right? And an algorithm, which is, has better computational complexity, but is actually more poorly implemented will still perform better. So you can't, um, you can't just let that, you know, you can't just forget about your, your optimizations and be like, okay, the hardware is going to take care of it. You know, you're just wasting basically the capability that's there. And so some of these databases, um, the way that some of the blockchain clients are using them is they're just making so many requests just to look up something basic. And, you know, if we, if we do a 10th of the request or a 20th of the request, you know, that's how much more requests we're going to get out of the hardware. So, um, you know, I think in some cases, if you look at some numbers like MonoDB probably makes one or two requests to look up an account. Whereas if you look at, you know, something that's not in cache, if you, if you look at other, some of the data structures, you may end up making 20 requests to the hardware. So it's just that sort of like super optimization to, to extract every last bit of performance we can get. Yeah. And I, I want to um, jump in. I know Danny has a, a pretty solid question that that just sparked as well. Um, but would love to quickly touch on one of Monad's other four uh, key optimizations, which is um, separation of execution and consensus. So essentially having execution and consensus operating in two separate swim lanes. Um, can Keone or James, I'll, I'll leave it up to, to you guys who would like to answer this one, but um, can you just talk a bit about some of the performance gains? Like why is that an optimization um, and why is it a more efficient model than kind of interleaving execution and consensus in the ways that uh, we typically see with current blockchains? Um, well, yeah, if you, if you, if you don't require the execution completes by the time that um, consensus completes, then you have, you can run them in parallel and you have more time to do both. So um, the, it's, it's not a, it's not a, I think one popular misconception about this is it's some sort of restriction like that you can't run them together or, you know, that Mana is requiring that you wait or to see, there's actually no restriction. It's just, we've relaxed how they synchronize with each other. Um, and then we kind of handle that relaxation with a deterministic sort of algorithm where they communicate back and forth. So, um, you know, one is not allowed to basically cheat the other one, so to speak, but, um, yeah, you know, just running them in parallel gives you more time. If you have to execute the block uh, before you can re respond to consensus, then then you're slowing down like the responsiveness of the chain, basically. So, yeah, another analogy I like to use, which is really dumb, but it's like when people tell you that you only use, they cite this like supposed fact that you only use ten percent of your brain. Um, I don't think that's actually true because I think the denominator is is wrong there. It has like some sort of supporting tissue in the denominator, but kind of the same thing holds true within a blockchain. I'm like in Ethereum right now, 12 second block times. The rough budget for execution is about 100 milliseconds within that 12 seconds, which is crazy because it's one percent. So literally, the block time is really big. And then, you know, only 1% of that time is being allocated to execution. So, of course, that really limits the the gas limit that, that you can use within a block. That really limits the amount of work that can be done. So moving execution out of being a prerequisite for consensus, running in parallel, like running in parallel to the next round of consensus 
is a massive, um, massive unlock for execution. Yeah. And like I said, again, just, it's not a restriction. Like you, if you want to, if you're a leader and you want to execute all the transactions before you send out your proposal, you can do that. You know, it's going to require more powerful hardware, but it's, it's up to you. Like there's nothing in the software, which is stopping you, nothing in the protocol, which is stopping you from doing that. It's just that it gives a greater budget to everyone else to, to kind of run them in parallel. And we think the UX is the same. Well, I think I'm starting to get a feel for the answer to this next question already, and I'm sure the listeners are too. But it's no secret that no shortcuts has become somewhat of a tagline from Monad. But I don't know if people understand the full context behind this. So I'd love to unpack what are some shortcuts that you could have taken in development over the last couple of years that other teams who are rushing to market likely will take? And why was it important to take the hard road in the long run? Yeah, I think, first of all, one goal of Monad is to be able to run on commodity hardware. Um, so I already mentioned like a shortcut is you could just throw a bunch of hardware at this. Um, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's just not a good option because it's harder for people to participate, regular people to participate in the network. Um, it's more expensive to participate in the network. But I, I think on the flip side of that, you know, even if you did require that hardware, you would still want to extract the maximum performance. Why why be 20K TPS if you could be 200K TPS, right? So like set sort of your set sort of your dollar budget on what kind of hardware you want to spend. And, you know, we don't, you know, like I mentioned before, that a common SSD, a modern SSD is $200. So, okay, you know, are we okay with that? Yeah, we're okay with that. You know, Mon is not trying to run on a Raspberry Pi on the flip side of things, whereas some blockchains are trying to run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so you just kind of have to sort of pick where you're going to land and, and you pick that. And then once you've picked that, then you want to extract as, math, as much performance as, as possible out of that. Um, like Keone mentioned, we, in HFT, we were, everything was super optimized. Um, we were down in tens or hundreds of nanoseconds to do a lot of work. And so, um, it's just a, that sort of like being this hyper competitive industry is, is really inspiring to like, try to optimize things and get as much possible performance that you can out of the machine. And then once, you know, once you're close to that, you're kind of done because you, you know, you can't make, you can't make the hardware do more than it can do. So you, you kind of start with a, a place. So, you know, you, like the SSD drive example I gave is 500 K IOPS per second. Well, that's like my budget. I, there's nothing I can do about that unless I be, go and become a hardware engineer, which, you know, some people do like they become FPGA engineers and they build their own hardware. Some people are doing that sort of thing in blockchain, and that's interesting. But um, on Monet, we're not we're not building hardware; we're just building software right now. So um, we just want to extract the maximum performance and really deeply understand everything that we do. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time running experiments with RocksDB, LMDB, um, all these sorts of DBs, and really understand where is the where are the issues in engineering and it's a lot of experimentation and it's very quantitative sort of based um, design and engineering. And, you know, you just, these things take time. Like you just can't, you know, it's, you just can't like wave your hand and problems go away. You have to really invest and, um, you know, going back to HFT thing again, it just takes, you know, some projects took like a couple of years to build. Um, to get the lowest latency or become competitive on a trade. You know, some firms work on certain trades for many years and some, and in some cases they never make it, but you know, a lot of cases it takes them two or three years before they develop the capability to actually be competitive in the market on that sort of trade. So yeah, it's just things take time and doing things well takes time. And, and that's kind of the route that we decided to. And it's also because we're like, we're building everything from scratch. So it's like, you know, building everything to be as performant as possible, doing the research, sometimes like exploring many different options before choosing the best one. So I have 
One kind of just quicker, more off topic question on the HFT front. Um, and I believe I've asked you guys before, but I'm not 100% sure. But just like to give a quick understanding of, um, are you guys able to say like what type of like daily volume or like yearly volume you guys used to trade? Like I'm picturing like a young Keone and James um, tag teaming on the HFT side and just want to know like what type of size that looks like. Yeah, I mean, we were transacting in very liquid, very high volume, very competitive markets, um, especially in the future space. A huge amount of volume transacts and the margins are very, very thin. Um, yeah, I mean, I did some math recently and um, found that our historical daily volumes were in the tens of billions of notional. So every day we would trade like 20 to $50 billion in notional volume. Um, and that's coming from the fact that we're trading in traditional finance financial markets where there are many big players that are putting on hedges or taking off hedges or, you know, like the finance space is just, you know, like notionally much, much bigger than the crypto space. Um, and it's very, very efficient and very competitive. And there's also a lot of like, you know, HFT running into other HFT kind of volume. Like it's a, it's really a game of inches. Um, you know, like less than a basis point of profit margin on a given trade. So these are like, you know, big trades with very, very small margin of error. Um, but then, you know, it also add like in addition to like, from a financial perspective, very small margin, also like very small margin of, um, you know, winning and losing races on the latency side. So that just motivated a lot of uh, a lot of optimization. Got you. Yeah, just doing some quick math, and I'm sure both of you are better at math than I am. Um, but yeah, that I believe that comes out to something like ten trillion ish dollars traded per year. Um, that's a pretty big number. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's pretty crazy, the notional flying back and forth. Yeah, I think it just, you know, for us, it sort of puts in perspective that, like, you know, DeFi notionals are all still quite small. Um, and, you know, so if you just imagine, like, normal, like, traditional financial institutions trading on chain, um, you know, maybe taking advantage of some of the aspects of decentralized finance, like self-custody and composability, um, trustlessness. There's a lot of potential there, but we also need the crypto rails to be able to handle that kind of scale. Um, I would also mention like, you know, we were sending tens of millions of orders per day across many different markets because we're trading like hundreds of different instruments. But yeah, I mean, like you need the blockchain to be able to support that level of just like interaction that um automated participants as well as as humans were you know all these orders that are being sent so for example with um with monad one thing that we think will be like an early um just like important thing within the monad ecosystem is a fully on-chain limit order book and in order to support that we need to be able to support um sub sent fees so every time someone submits or cancels an order like that needs to be fractions of a cent and we need to be able to support um, thousands of orders per second in order to like support that level of adoption. Got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm picturing you two uh, working, spending years to create an algorithm to fight over a few basis points. And then your yeah. average DeFi user spending 10 seconds and slamming into 3% slippage to hit the right meme coin. I feel like they would much rather you guys do the work up front to, get this execution at a, a better spot yeah yeah it was a lot of work a lot of fun a lot of um yeah like interesting problems to be solved um you know it was we had a good time we had a our whole team was was awesome uh, but yeah i mean i think that was just a good good training ground for what we're doing now i think you also perfectly highlighted some of the true differences and how big the gap is 
between traditional finance and DeFi. So I'm curious as well, what is the biggest bottleneck that's currently preventing the EVM from scaling? And how is Monad taking this on? Yeah, well, the, the biggest bottleneck, as we discussed, is the state access. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of sort of micro optimizations that Monad makes, 5% here, percent there. Um, you know, just to like throw one out, there's a there's a translation look aside buffer, which is basically how the hardware trans um, translates virtual addresses to physical addresses. Um, you know, we optimize that sort of thing. What does that get us? Probably like five percent. Um, other people are not going to bother, but you know, five percent is five percent. You get ten five percent, that's fifty percent. So. Um, you know, we're always measuring, always looking at what the hardware is doing. Um, we, you know, we have um, sort of tests that, that we carried over from HFT, you know, looking at what it, I compile this function, what do the ins assembly instructions look like? Uh, you know, we, at that sort of level of detail, I don't probably, I'm guessing that not very many people in block, blockchain space are looking at that level of detail. Uh, so, you know, it's just those, all these sorts of like little percentages add up to, to be a significant speed up. Um, you know, there's there's other aspects where I think like I'm not convinced. For example, the access lists. Um, we talked about this on Twitter a little bit. Like access lists are maybe not good. They actually may be worse, right? So everybody's always asking, is Mana going to support access lists? Um, can you can you use access lists to be better at parallel execution? Can you use access lists to predict state access or sorry preload state or something? And like when I actually think about it, you know, some of these things which seem intuitive are actually not correct, right? And you're like, oh, if I know more information, I obviously can do better. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And so, you know, we're doing work in, internally to maybe flip that assumption on its head and basically say access lists are actually strictly worse. Um, so, you know, you take a you take a version of Monad which has no access list at all, and nobody passes an access list of for the, each transaction. And then you have another version where everyone tells you exactly what state they're going to access. And like, I think we can outperform that version. So um, these sorts of things, like this is intuition at this point. We don't have, you know, it's not fully decided. Um, it's intuition and calculations and other sorts of things. But I think in in blockchain, there's just People make a lot of assumptions when they discuss different technologies or different architectures, and I, you know, I feel like sometimes those assumptions are are wrong, right? And um, they, you know, they kind of get a lot of attention, but they're not actually they're not actually accurate on what makes the difference. So my takeaway here, as a lay person, totally non technical, as I'm sure some of our listeners are as well, is really that you can't just take parallel execution and slap it on. You just can't take a slightly more performant database or hardware and slap it on. It's really about a lot of various and highly focused optimizations that allow you to see true performance gain. And my assumption is that's why it's so important to, to take the long road here as well, right? Yeah, you sh you have to do the work, right? You have to do the fundamental sort of engineering and the fundamental science and make informed decisions. And there's also this there's also this thing of like just getting caught in local maximum. So, you know, like you think that this thing is fast and so you build it that way. And, you know, it it's the fastest of what um, you know, given some set of constraints, but maybe if you relax those constraints, you moved into a different area of the curve, you can actually build something even faster. So um, it takes, you know, a lot of intuition, a lot of experimentation. Um, there's no like, uh, you know, I remember this thing from my computer science course in undergrad, so I'm just going to build it that way. Sort of stuff going on here, like we're, we measure everything, we make no assumptions, we don't assume anything. Uh, you know, access lists is a perfect example. Like everybody just assumes that access lists are better. Like I just don't think that's true. And so, you know, you have to measure that. You have to measure that and experiment. You got to build it sometimes. And, you, you know, you, we write a lot of code that we throw away. Um, the common thing here is like don't get emotionally attached to code. You know, you're probably going to write it and rewrite it and throw it away. 
and that's fine. So um, that's just kind of like basic sort of engineering uh, principles that we're following. You're saying that everyone is mid curving the certain aspects of the database choice or blockchain design. Uh, I don't know what mid curving means, but sure. <laughs> oh no. Okay. It's like, you know, the, the meme with the, it's like the IQ bell curve. And then there's like the, the caveman on the 70 IQ and then the Jedi on with 130, And then the, the basically like the, the pleb in the middle, who's like, you know, uh, coping about something or other. That's the mid curve meme. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people just say things that sound intuitive and you're like, oh, that sounds good, you know, and it's it's not really the case that that's the most optimal thing. And so um, there's a lot of like sound bites like, oh, yeah, that sounds reasonable or that sounds sort of, you know, you got to do the work and you got to test it and you got to you got to experiment and you got to see validate these sort of hypotheses. And a lot of times they, they can't be validated, right? They're not because they're not correct. So they can't be validated. I feel like there's. Um, people, this might be one of those assumptions, right? That just sounds intuitive, but maybe isn't. But I feel like in general, sometimes there's a disconnect between like engineering and what people are building and then like what a user actually wants. Um, and I feel like one of those has been people that are building EVM compatible chains. Uh, Monad is EVM compatible all the way to the bytecode level, right? So like everything functions the exact same. And there are some chains that will say, oh, yeah, we're EVM compatible. And then there's actually a few hiccups where, you know, something doesn't run the same. Um, it's not as straightforward as just directly deploying the same contract or or there's some differences in RPC. Um, are there any kind of like times where you see that uh, you see chains that are you know, trying to be EVM compatible, but maybe they take a shortcut and it ends up like hurting compatibility in the long run. Um, or are there any like standard examples that, that you've seen in crypto where that is the case? Yeah, well, um, first of all, you you kind of made me think of something where like, um, you know, different VMs, right? Like SVM or um, Wasm or, you know, I don't know what other VMs people have, um, MoVM or something. Uh, like the VM makes, um, you know, there was a narrative for a while, like, and maybe it's still true that like the VM makes a huge difference, and like that's a that's something I don't believe. Like EVM is a standard VM, you know. It's I I did a Java VM to C compiler back in, um, you know, grad school just for fun, sort of thing. Like there's not much difference between EVM and Java VM, for example, and that thing is. What thirty years old or thirty five years old or something? I don't know how old it is, but you know, like these these things are not these are like um, very minor differences, and they don't really make that big of a difference. And um, you know, it's kind of weird, like it has thirty two byte words and all this sort of stuff. But it's kind of weird in that way. Um, I understand why they did that, but uh, besides that, it's just a standard stack based VM, and um. You know these these kind of differences between these other VMs are, in my view, very minor. Um, but still, like they got a lot of attention for a while, right? Like we have this different VM. Oh wow, it must be so much better. Well, it's not really that much better. <laughs> you know, it might even be worse. But so, um, you know, I think I think the Ethereum VM is fine. Um, I think you can do with the Ethereum VM what you can do with any other VM. Um, I don't think that there's any intrinsic like special capability that other VMs have, advantages that other VMs have over um, the EVM. Um, but yeah, my, you know, I think to the point of like being fully Ethereum compatible, that's just about tooling and developer experience. And, you know, like, I, you know, like there is a solidity to Wasm compiler. Um, that's kind of where I was going with this VM talk. It's like, yeah, you, you could, you know, you could be language compatible, but not. Bico compatible, you know, you can be Bico compatible, but maybe you don't have the same um, sort of Merkleization of the state. So somebody else has to change, you know, if you want to build a bridge, you want to do this sort of thing, you have to change it. So, you know, it's just, it's all about developer experience and just being consistent with Ethereum and everything can just port right over and no issues. 
Um, the less time developers spend worrying about you know these sort of differences, the more time they can actually focus on the business logic and building what's good for the consumer and the user. Um, but as far as what like users value, I think they probably value latency. You know, no one wants to sit and wait for anything. <laughs> Everybody these days are like um, very impatient. I want to see a response. I want to click here and I want to see the web page load immediately. And actually, it's kind of funny because web is getting worse, right? Like websites keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you click and, you know, they don't load or they load slowly or this sort of thing. And so it's like the users, the user desire is actually things are actually moving the opposite of where things should be going for user activity. Um, I saw like response. I can't remember. I could be totally making this up, but it's like the average user will wait 200 milliseconds before they give up and click over to a different tab or click over to a different website. So if your website doesn't load in 200 milliseconds, you give up this sort of thing. So, you know, there's these sorts of things. So obviously users value responsiveness. They value latency. Um, on the throughput side, um, you know, it depends on the app. If I'm just playing a game, I'm making a bet, you know, I'm like I'm betting on a football game and I'm going to make one bet a quarter of the game or something. I'm making four bets over the span of like an hour and a half or something. Um, I don't really care about the, you know, the bandwidth of that app unless I can't get my bet in. I, I don't care about you. Like you can't get your bet in. That's not my problem. Like I, I just want to get my bet in. So. For some apps, you know, like throughput doesn't, it's kind of not relevant to the individual user, but if you want to have a lot of users, you got to have significant throughput. Um, so, you know, and in, in computer science, there's often a trade-off between throughput and latency. And so you're always kind of striking that balance. You know, there might be an algorithm that gives you better throughput, but the latency gets worse. So um, we're kind of like juggling those two sorts of things and trying to give trying to build a blockchain that gives the best experience to the user. I like how the SSDs are getting better, but the web pages are getting worse. Yeah, I was just talking to somebody recently, <laughs> right? And they're like, the the hardware is increasing at such a great rate, and yet your app experience on your desktop is getting shittier like every year. And, you know, what does that tell you? That tells you that, like, the programmers are getting worse every year. Like, why are they making... <laughs> apps that are 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 so much worse and decaying the performance is decaying at a rate faster than the hardware can keep up and um that's just like a perfect example of what i was talking about before you know you can't um you know the apps should be getting the response in this should be amazing and yet they're actually getting worse and we we got all this amazing hardware and the hardware people are doing their job um but the you know the user experience is just getting worse so you know, we have to fully like extract what we can from the hardware and really benefit from that. James keeps SSDs at his house. He stockpiles SSDs at his house like gold bars. He's got a yeah. closet full of them. SSDs are like other people's GPUs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a while <laughs> ago, like you could just get a bunch of GPUs. You could be like, yeah, there's going to be a shortage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm glad you're positioned for that. Position for the future. <laughs> well, we are running a little bit short on time anyways, but we have a couple more questions that I think people will be really interested to hear hear your answers to. And one that's resonated with me time and again already on this podcast is that it's really hard to get accurate information. Um, not everyone has the privilege of, of talking with gigabrains like I do today. Um, and particularly in the context of the parallel EVM, which has been top of mind lately for a lot of folks on the timeline, it's hard to get accurate info and it's hard to identify what is truly going to push performance gains. And logically, you'd think, can't we all just share benchmarks? But from your perspective, what is the best way to, to do this, to highlight the true performance gains that we'll get from Monad compared to whatever else is out there? Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of computer stuff has standard benchmarks. Um, graphics cards have standard benchmarks. Um, CPUs have standard benchmarks. You know, some people like them, some people don't. Some people complain about them for different reasons. Um, you know, the gaming gaming companies sometimes game them. You know, the 
there, I think there was a graphics card time where like the driver would detect it's running a benchmark and it would switch into a different mode and perform better. Uh, so, you know, but you know, right now, I think in crypto, there's no benchmarks, right? Like anybody can go to Twitter and claim anything and there's no, there's nobody to hold them to that number. There's no sort of standard. So, you know, I think, um, from the, from a long time, we've kind of treated replaying Ethereum history as our benchmark internally. Um, and I, the recent Ethereum history, like the beginning of Ethereum history is just basically token transfers. And even a not so great optimized client can do 50k TPS um, of token transfers at the beginning of Ethereum history. So, um, you know, the other thing is like, oh, TPS, what does TPS mean? Does it mean actual like Uniswap transactions, um, borrowing protocol transactions, or does it mean token transfers? So, um, you know, people throw out like, oh, 200 that 200 K TPS. What is, well, what, it, what kind of transactions are those 200 K transactions? Right. And like I said, if you think about it, if it's just token transfers and you think about like a not very optimized client can do 50 K TPS of token transfers, then that's not actually an impressive number. Right. But it's, so it's, you got to have some context to like evaluate the number as well. If you don't have any context, it, it can very easily sound impressive which is desirable for people for different reasons. But um, we've, we've always, like I said, we've always used kind of recent Ethereum history as our benchmark. Um, you know, our plan is to build a, a repo, publicly available GitHub repo, where people can actually download and replicate benchmarks from our chain and others. And, you know, I think, I think open sort of benchmarks is the best way to go. If we, if we run a blockchain client from another project and they're like, oh, you know, oh, it did 5K TPS and they come and say, well, no, it should be doing 10. Well, that's fine. Tell us, you know, to, or make the change yourself. It's a GitHub repo. Submit a pull request. Maybe we configured something wrong. Maybe we, maybe it runs better on this file type of file system on Linux than a different type of file system. Okay, we can switch it. Like, that's not a big deal. You know, I think like, we don't want to be too restrictive, you know, but if you say, Hey, like we benchmarked it with 32 gigabytes of Ram and now I want to throw 256 gigabytes of Ram at it. Uh, that's fine. But like not everyone else is running with 32. So is that really fair? You know, so there's, there has to be some sort of like standardized uh, benchmarks. And I think like recent Ethereum history is a pretty reasonable one. Um, you know, I recently we thought about like we could also do some of the L2s. There's, you know, L2s are getting decent traffic these days. Um, you could do other sort of uh, Ethereum compatible um, L1s, like replay their history. Maybe their history is different than Ethereum. So I think it's, I think it's fair. You know, the benchmarks run slowly at minimum, like to run to replay a decent amount of data, maybe like a couple hours. If you really want to replay like the whole thing, it might be a couple of days, that sort of thing. So, um, but you know, let's, let's just like standardize it. And that's also going to help like the progress of the technology for everyone. You can go and kind of see what, you know, what I was just talking about before making informed like scientific and engineering decisions. You can go see, oh, why is, you know, why is Monad doing it good in this case? Maybe I can take that idea and incorporate it into my client later or something so you know um it's rather let's kind of like improve the standard of the industry as a whole in terms of its engineering um you know uh, practices and scientific practices and move move away from just like less intuition sort of marketing sort of practices and, and be a little bit more rigorous i think bringing a lot more rigor is something we can monad can add to the blockchain industry yeah it reminds me of the um, every now and then there are like controversies with scientific papers where someone publishes paper and then later like someone else tries to reproduce it and and they can't um so i guess recently the um ambient condition semiconductor it's like that some published paper and then a lot of people tried to replicate it and they could not so having like standardized procedures like james said a, a github repo that you can just clone and run on an aws box of a particular specification 
that's like, yeah, just very important standardization. We'll be contributing benchmarks um, both for the Monad client and for um, like some Ethereum clients, but really hopeful that the the broader crypto community contributes as well with, um, you know, pull requests that integrate like these benchmarks for other other blockchains or other data stores as well. And I think it really underlies, you know, one of the other issues that James mentioned, which I'll just highlight, is that, um, you know, state access is the bottleneck, and the shortcut for that is to just use really large amounts of RAM. So it's really easy to cheat your benchmarks by just running on a box with like 256 gigs of RAM or more. Uh, and RAM is two orders of magnitude more expensive than SSD, like a two terabyte SSD and a uh, high quality NVMe SSD that James has 500 of in his closet. Those are $200 each. It's, you know, it's really awesome, really performant, two terabytes, $200. But then that same amount two terabytes of RAM is $20,000. So, you know, it's just like way cheaper. It's going to scale better. You know, state will grow over time, but, you know, that's a manageable amount of growth if you're spending $200 to get another two terabytes as opposed to like if you have to grow the RAM. So, yeah, I think the short, it's pretty clear that like when we started with Monad and implemented parallel execution and ran into the state bottleneck, there's like a easy way out, which is to just jack up the RAM requirements, but that doesn't scale. It's not decentralized. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, then later on, we would be running into this issue where we just, the nodes would need more and more RAM. So uh, just taking the, doing the right thing and then contributing to the space with something new that is, is really needed, that's really optimized for this problem of storing data in Merkle tree. Supporting parallel access. That's that's the name of the game. Yeah, it seems like for the like an analogy for the TPS benchmark too is someone being like, "Oh, I can do twenty math problems in a minute," and then you know this other guy is doing like super hard uh, super hard calculus, and he's like, "Well, I can only do one per minute." Like this guy's obviously much better at math than I am. Um, but it would do the industry a lot of good as if everyone took the same math test and then you took how long it is, or you take how long it took to complete the math test. Um, and that's a much more fair way to see, you know, how efficient is, you know, this machine at doing all these math problems. Um, hopefully we'll see some improvement there. Uh, and hopefully people are kind of forced to, to adhere to the standard when Monad starts putting out some benchmarks. Um, yeah, I know we, we are running up on time here. Um, had two more questions that we could kind of hit uh, in a bit of rapid fire fashion. Um, Keone, this one probably goes to you. But uh, anytime like a new layer one or an alt L1 comes out, uh, people just assume that the goal is to kill Ethereum and take over the crypto space um, and run away happily ever after. Uh, we know that this is not the path that Monet is taking. Um, so I wanted to float the question, right? Like, how do you think Monad, you know, meaningfully contributes to Ethereum? Um, or how does it expand the EVM uh, ecosystem overall? Yeah, I think there's growing recognition within the Ethereum research community that um, the thing that Monad is doing uniquely, like rebuilding the execution stack from the ground up, researching this custom database, um, researching different optimizations, implementing parallel execution, implementing asynchronous execution. Like these are things that th it's good for someone to explore. And for various reasons, the existing client teams haven't had the resources to go down that direction. They're focused on other problems, which are orthogonal and also interesting and important. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, Ethereum has you know def created a standard the evm is a powerful bytecode standard there's very rich tooling applications a lot of applied cryptography research all being done in the context of the evm and uh, you know like monad has benefited a lot from all of the work that has come before and we're 
exploring in a new orthogonal direction that we think will ultimately help push the space forward, whether that's uh, through like changes in Monad ultimately getting incorporated into Ethereum. Um, I think we, you know, we'd be excited about that because we're going to continue to keep pushing the boundaries, the frontiers of what's possible. And um, yeah, I mean, just like contribute to a space that's very rich and very uh, diverse already. Awesome. Yeah. Extremely well said. Um, yeah. And, you know, last question, um, typically, or at least in the last episode, Danny and I have been taking a page out of Kobe and Ledger's book of Up Only, where the final question is labeled the final alpha. Um, and usually it's aimed to get like one piece of wisdom that someone's accumulated over their life and they want to share with the listeners. Um, in this case, thought it would be pretty good to do a final alpha for other people who are trying to build parallel EVMs in this space. Um, you guys have, you know, two years of experience exploring this space, you know, kind of the godfathers of the parallel EVM have done a ton of work pushing forward and, and optimizing. Um, and a lot of people are super excited about parallel EVM right now. And, you know, they're kind of dipping their toes in the water, experimenting with, uh, you know, what is performant? How can we try to push this, this like new emerging vertical of crypto forward as, as much as possible? Um, but yeah, if you guys have any kind of final alpha advice for um, anyone else experimenting in the parallel EVM space, trying to yeah move move the space forward in that front, problems that you've run into that you think would be um, that they'd be wise to avoid, or or anything along those lines. Um, if it's too much alpha, Danny can always cut it out at the end. But uh, yeah, any any words of advice for other people looking to to kind of dip their toes into the space? Thanks so much, Keone and James, for joining us today, dropping all that alpha. I know the listeners are going to be really excited to get more context on the parallel EVM and the various other optimizations that Monad's been working on for quite a while now. Looking forward to sharing some benchmarks as well, and of course, getting the builders and users onto Monad when it's live. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for having us.